There's the that was me, I think. Yeah, that is you. That's certainly not me. Um, So um, my organisation is the International Confederation of Principals and we are the only global um, school leaders umbrella professional, organisation of professional associations um, around the world. So we represent um, both individuals and groups and associations <laughs> of both principals and aspiring principals. Um, and so that means principals and vice principals and anybody who is looking to be in the field of leadership in education. So um, we are really um, uh, pleased that um, BC have become a member. And um, just a little bit about the network of school leader associations and therefore school leaders. Um, where The whole idea behind the network is to be purposeful in what we do and you'll see um, what our agenda is um, um, coming up. But um, it's just to make sure that we've got that collective voice around school leadership because we all know that how important that is and sometimes that gets a little lost in the um, in the rollout of things around the world that um, teachers come first because they're in front of the kids and uh, leaders seem to come second. But if systems knew that if they got the leadership right, they'd actually get the stuff that happened inside the classrooms um, uh, better. Um, but they haven't kind of, it's a little backwards in the way that, that, that it goes. So that's part of what we do. So, um, and as it says there, we're nonpartisan and, and uh, secular. <laughs> Phil? So this slide here is um, from our um, our latest flyer, and um, this this is about you know what what it is we're all about. So um, don't worry about um, that. We'll make sure that you've got a copy of it, and uh, and that you can then give it out to your membership. And quite welcome to do that. But what we do is we lead leaders, and we do that through influencing. Uh, looking at leadership development and trying to change the perspective uh, like I was talking about. We link leaders together. So um, these numbers, when this was done last year, um, were the numbers. They're they're not the numbers anymore. They're much higher than that. Mm -hmm. Um, When we were in um, Cape Town, we had 28 nations um, represented. Um, And so um, our membership uh, current database has nearly 70,000 people on it, so 50 is uh, uh, was a small estimate. Um, so those numbers are a whole lot greater than that. Um, but it's significant in who we link with in our network. So we're a significant network of leaders. And, um, and what we try to do through the linking is learning and learning for leaders. So, um, you know, um, it's, it's really about being part of uh, a group of global leaders around the world and um, looking at growth and development and uh, raising awareness and sharing our resources because together we're greater than being by ourselves. So, Phil? Um, these are our, this, we've been working on this and these are our current priorities. Um, and as you can see, the number one priority is health and wellbeing, ethical leadership, which is what the webinar was about today, um, equity and principal advocacy. Um, and we do that through five lenses and the lenses are membership, communication, advocacy, partnerships and management. And management is actually um, governance of the organisation. So, um, and they are the five five areas with which we um, look at all of those things. And we have some great partnerships. And the top three up there are all about health and wellbeing. So ACU and uh, Phil's branch of that, the Positive Psychology and Education, and Virgin Pulse and the Global Challenge are all about health and wellbeing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Microsoft, we have a memorandum of understanding with, and Nestle, who are an um, organisation out of Australia that we're developing a global leaders course with um, that will be looking at 
leaders who lead leaders. And so, and it's about looking at what that looks like in a global context and sharing from each other. So um, that's a new offering. And, um, but what we're going to be talking a lot about today is the um, Australian Principal Occupational Health and Safety Wellbeing Survey. And next one, live from Melbourne, that's you. Okay. Yeah, your turn. My turn. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know about the website, the um, that's the address there, and you can download all the reports that we've we've done over the years from Australia, Ireland, and New Zealand. You actually you can't get all the New Zealand reports yet because they are also connected to the union, and they've um, decided, I think, actually in their wisdom, that they're they're releasing their reports in a staggered fashion. So there's the first bit of year two's report on the New Zealand website, but there's more to come this year. Organisations even as a defensive legal strategy or because they're serious about doing things. What they've usually done is put a bolt-on wellbeing program on top of whatever it is that they already do. And the research is pretty clear that that does virtually nothing. And that they have to think about wellbeing as an integral part of everything that you do. So, I like this model as a, a kind of jigsaw. If there's any piece missing, it's not going to work. And they're the, the key elements. And the best way to measure all of these things is usually measuring engagement. So um, just a good model to think about. And it's made up of a whole lot of different things which we won't go. Now, this slide is kind of um, screwed up a bit, but that's just the reference at the bottom. In occupational health and safety, we think about um, all of these issues in terms of primary, secondary and tertiary interventions. And um, traditionally what's happened is that all of the um, resources go into tertiary interventions, which is basically supporting people who've been damaged by their work. In the same way that um, for a long time, schools put a lot of their efforts into dealing with difficult kids once they'd acted out and realised that actually there's better ways to do it, which is changing your, your practices so that you stop the bad behaviour before it starts. In the same way, we need to rethink how we look at education in terms of redesigning the work. So that's the, under the primary interventions. You can see job designing and promoting protective factors is really where you can get the biggest bang for your buck. And then there's certainly... Um, what we seem to be seeing now is a huge growth in the secondary intervention space, which is people offering wellbeing programs or how to have difficult conversations or those sorts of things, which are all useful. But the, the primary goal of the organisational um, attack on this should be to actually redesign the work. And the good news is in Australia, we're finally getting to that point after seven years of data collection around principles, health and wellbeing that um, central um, education departments have realised that actually the job does need to be redesigned or the whole system needs to be redesigned, um, including the principal as a key part of that. So if we go to the survey, um, the, the clear issue is working hours in terms of um, threats to people's health. So just as a bit of background, the ILO set the maximum working hours at 48 hours a week and 90 hours, and that's never been changed. So, um, and they said it in, in 1930, beyond that, um, health and safety risks increase a lot. Now, the US Department of Health did a big study on this to confirm all that. So working more than 10 hours a day leads to a 60% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. 10% of people working 50 to 60 hours a week report relationship problems. And we're seeing that in the trend data in the Australian survey, which has been going for seven years. We have an increasing number of single principles. Um, that increases to 30% for people working more than 60 hours a week. By the way, 60 hours is the average. So we've got half the principals in the country working more than 60 hours a week and half working slightly less, but the average is 60. Working more than 40 hours a week is in, in, associated with all kinds of lifestyle diseases. And um, 
you know, let's face it, after 50 hours a week, most of us are not terribly productive and we'd be better off having a rest anyway. Um, the, the real risk around this, though, is the cardiovascular disease risk because in many countries, I'm not sure about Canada, but certainly in Australia, we've got a vast number of principals who are within about five years of retirement age and um, high levels of stress in younger people is the um, heart disease is the real risk. So for older people, the risk of um, chronic stress is depression and anxiety, but for younger people, it's heart disease. And that's backed up by these um, figures from the US Department of Health. So we've got this crisis looming of these people who are leaving about to be replaced by much younger people who are far less experienced in life, far less experienced in education at a time when the accountability requirements are ramping up hugely. So the chronic stress is going to be there for a long time unless we rapidly change the design of the job. And that means we, we're literally going to shave years off people's lives by asking them to perform tasks that are pretty much impossible. Um, now, it gets worse. <laughs> There's been a study done in Australia on this data a set called the um, HILDA Household Labour and Income Dynamics Survey. And they've looked at the gender difference between work. So remember the ILO set 48 hours as the maximum and that was in the days when women stayed at home and did housework and men went out to work and did the outside paid work. Well, clearly that's not the case anymore. So the, um, the HILDA data was re-examined by the group from ANU and um, they classed high domestic workloads at more than 20 hours a week of work at home. That's not being at home, but the actual work of being at home. Now, when you look at that, it doesn't take very long to get 20 hours a week of work. And they class long hours of work at more than 40 hours a week. Well, that's, you know, two thirds of the average principal's work hours. <coughs> and it interacts to produce all kinds of health problems. So women's health tracks lower than men once they hit 35 hours a week. And beyond 39 hours a week, the average Australian working adult, adult between 24 and 64 deteriorates. But there's a 13 hour gender gap, the tipping point. So let's go to the next thing. This slide has not worked out very well at all. The headings have disappeared. Um, I can explain that to you. The first column that's blank is all the headings. <laughs> the second column is Australian work hours. So the 53.5 the is the mean hours, 58 is the median, and 47 and 66 is the percentage over the danger limit that those two numbers represent. The next column is Ireland. So they are 22 to 42% over the danger limit. And, you can, and the third column is New Zealand, which is exactly the same as Australia. I've got a better slide of that that shows the, the drop off in mental health. So you can see that underemployment is as dangerous for people as overemployment. And um, mental health begins to decline at 10 hours below the ILO limit and 20 hours below the average working hours for principals. And if we look at the line, that's where the Irish principals are and that's where Australia and New Zealand is. I don't know if you know your average working hours for principals in Canada, but my suspicion is that the Irish numbers are low because there are... Um, huge numbers of one teacher schools in Ireland. And I think some of the principals would have been um, reporting their working hours as their leadership hours, not their work hours, because they're teaching as well. So I, I imagine that the Irish numbers are actually probably closer to Australia and New Zealand as av on average and probably in Canada as well. And if you look at that, the, the trail off of the dotted line, which is women, um, decreases more quickly than for men. So you can see that in Australia and New Zealand, we've got the female principals are at the same level of threat as uh, women who are, are underemployed. 
So there's a serious problem in terms of work hours. And if we have a look at the work hours, um, what's causing that is these two things here. So this is, we ask principals to just rate out of 10 how much stress they feel through various items. And you can see what those are. But across the survey, all seven years, each bar represents a year of the survey. It's the sheer quantity of work and lack of time to focus on teaching and learning that principals report as the number one and number two stresses. Now, you can see that the trend line from 2014 on both of those is pretty bad. The work intensification is just ramping up hugely. It started high with smaller numbers and then is increasing um, year on year. Now, those two things shouldn't really go together for a school principal. They should be saying, I'm doing a lot of hours of work because I'm doing a lot of teaching and learning, but it's not. They're doing administrative work and they feel what we call in the literature moral stress around that. They're not doing the work for which they think they have been employed and for which they think they should be doing. Um, so that's the big issue. Now, in, in New Zealand and Australia, those numbers are almost exactly the same. So this is something about the profession, not about the particular individuals in any one country, I think. They're very dedicated and they do see this as a huge source of stress. But the other ones that we need to think about that are also worrying is the mental health issues of students, and you have a look at the trend line on that, and the mental health issues of staff, and the trend line on that is equally frightening. At the rate they're going, they're going to be the number one stresses unless we intervene in some way that's useful. And just to give you um, a quick version of the three countries, these are the, this is the major part of the survey, which is called the, the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire. And it's broken up into about um, 25 dimensions. And we'll quickly go through each of them and I'll show you each country. So that in all of these next slides, the, the blue line represents the general population. So this survey has been normed across multiple industries and 27, I think, countries. So it's in about 25 languages. Um, hundreds of thousands of people have done it. So these, these population figures are very robust. The only problem with them is we're not comparing apples with apples because this is the population figures represent the lowest paid blue collar worker to the highest paid white collar worker. And we, you know, would really like a comparator group, which is leaders in other industries, I guess. But I haven't got that. So we've just got general population figures for now. So you can see quantitative demands, the sheer amount of work they have to do is way higher than the general population. And the speed at which they have to do it is also very high. Cognitive demands are good. That's the only positive one on this slide. Cognitive demands are things that make your brain grow. So they're very useful for you, um, much higher than the general population. But emotional demands and demands for hiding emotions are also very high and they're not good for you. Um, so you can see, but the interesting thing is how similar they are across three countries, um, which is repeated in all of the other slides. So work organisation and job contents, principals have more influence, although the Irish not so much. Um, possibilities for development is good, variation is good, meaning of work and commitment to the workplace is very high. And the sting in the tail of that is that departments of education around the world kind of know that and they can make more demands knowing that the principals will backfill and make it happen. I've never met a principal yet who would let the children down in their school so they will do all of the extras even if the resources are being taken away by central offices. And when you look at the work hours, that's a clear example of it. You know, the, the official work hours for a school principal, I think is 35 hours a week. And yet they're doing nearly double that. So they're doing, the norm is one full-time paid job plus one full-time unpaid job. And um, that's reflected in the meaning of work and the commitment to the workplace. The other thing about those figures that I think is worth um, noting is that um, 
despite everything, principals are telling us what they enjoy about the job, which is good. So I'm, I'm am very confident that these figures are accurate, both the positive and the negative. Um, interpersonal relations and leadership, there's a, there are a number of things here that um, are around about the population level. And you can see there's a little bit of country difference here. So uh, Australian principals feel less recognised and rewarded for their work than either Ireland or New Zealand. And the quality of leadership in Ireland appears to be a lot lower. And that's who the principals report to. But the, the worrying um, aspect of this is that social support from colleagues and supervisors is seen as very low, much lower than the general population. And partly that's because they're doing so many hours stuck in their school, but the supervisory support is clearly an issue in three jurisdictions. It may be with you as well. Um, and that's something that can be actually worked on without terribly much cost involved because the people are already there. It's just they're not connecting in a way that's being perceived as, as useful by the principal. And so where this plays out in terms of individuals is work-family conflict. So you can see job satisfaction is very high. Despite everything, um, job satisfaction is high. And in fact, it's growing. Um, in Australia over seven years, that trend line for job satisfaction is up slightly um, across the seven years. But work-family conflict is running at 2.2 times the population rate. Now, work-family conflict is work getting in the way of your family functioning. It's the phone call home saying, I'm sorry, I can't come home. I can't come to the child's birthday. I can't come to whatever it is. I can't, I can't, I can't, because there's too many things I have to do. Um, we have the tragic um, example from Western Australia this year when the, the 2017 data was released. On the same day, the front page of the newspaper was about a principal who dropped dead at her desk on at 10 o'clock on Sunday night. Now. Um, this is the kind of thing that the health statistics tell us is that people who are at risk of chronic heart disease because of the continuous stress, sometimes the first symptom is death. And that's you hear about the, you know, the 50-year-old or the 55-year-old who everybody thought was on top of their game and pretty healthy and, and happy and you know sporty and stuff suddenly keels over one day with a massive heart attack. And that's the first sign that they were under chronic stress. And um, <clears throat> work family conflict obviously increases that. If you've got chronic stress at, at the workplace, which creates more stress at home, you're going to eventually have things like family breakdown. And um, so it just means the stress gets compounded. Um, if you have a look at values, trust regarding management, despite all of that, is high, even though there's not so much supervisory support. Mutual trust between employees, which is also called horizontal trust in the organisation, um, is not too bad, although it's not as good in Australia as everywhere else. Um, justice, people see schools as just places where people are treated fairly and social inclusiveness is high. Um, that's all good. So that, again, they're telling us the good news as well as the bad news. But the individual health outcomes um, are very sobering. So self-rated health is just a single item in the survey that says rate your health from one to 10. And hundreds of epidemiological studies have shown that that is one of the best long-term predictors of people's health there is going, better than most projected medical tests. People just intuitively know how well they are and when you look at the markers that should suggest people are well or not well, principals tick all the boxes for being way above average. So they're well educated, they're well paid relative to the rest of the population. They are, despite what I've just been saying about work family conflict, they're in pretty much in stable families and have definitely come from stable family backgrounds. Um, you know, they just tick all the boxes and yet they've never come up to the average and you can see Australia slightly worse than everywhere else, New Zealand slightly better than everywhere else, um, but they don't even come up to the average. Now, we've had over five years, we've had um, half the 
population of principals, sorry, over seven years, we've had over half the population of principals um, complete the survey at least once and many have completed many more than one times. But we've had a huge number of retirements. So we've had about 2,000 people come in and out of the survey across those seven years. And yet those self-rated health figures have remained remarkably stable, which means it's a picture of the job, not the people, I think. And you can see all the negative things. Burnout, 1.7 times the population rate. Stress, 1.7 times. Sleeping troubles is 2.2 um, .2 times. And in terms of the danger zone, that, those averages are a little bit uh, misleading because there are clearly some people who are sleeping quite well because we've got 50% of people in the three countries who are in the danger zone for sleep deprivation. And, and those people are getting emails from me when they finish the survey um, automatically that say, you are um, reporting serious problems about your sleep, go and see your GP about this. Because sleep deprivation leads to all kinds of other problems. And um, 50, yeah, it's about 53% or something in the, in the most recent round for all three countries of principals are reporting that. And what we found is that going around talking to principal groups, principals only talk to each other about that they're not sleeping very well. And so they have normalised this abnormal behaviour because they say to their friend, you know, I'm not sleeping very well. And their friend says, no, I'm not either. We're just getting old, you know. And actually, that's not true. You should be sleeping well through the night through your whole life. You may sleep slightly less hours, but you should sleep well. Principles are not for all kinds of reasons, which I'm sure you all know. Um, but it's the 2 a.m. terror, as I call it, when you wake up and you've got 10 things going through your mind, of either things that happened that day or things that are about to happen the next day that are keeping people awake. So it's this chronic level of stress. So you can see depressive symptoms higher, somatic stress, that's the physical aches and pains associated with stress. And when people are stressed um, sitting at a desk, it means they tend to breathe very shallowly. And those things mean your internal organs don't work so well because the diaphragm's not working properly. And that leads to things like shoulder, neck and back problems. Um, cognitive stress, as opposed to cognitive demands, which we said um, were good for you. Cognitive stress is the recurring thoughts that you can't get out of your head. Um, they're not good for you. But you can see self-efficacy is high and in fact is increasing um, in the Australian data. Uh, so despite everything, the principals think they're doing pretty well. But clearly there's evidence to show that they're not. Um, this is the other one that has really shocked people in Australia and um, is about to shock people in New Zealand. This data hasn't been released yet in New Zealand, but they're tracking it basically exactly the same as us. Ireland have less of an issue around this, um, but you can see that um, uh, threats of violence in the, in the seven years of the survey, we've gone from 4.9 times the population rate to 5.6 times and actual violence has gone from seven times the population rate to nine times the population rate. Oops, I'll just go back to that. You can see the others are, uh, bullying is, is clearly a, an issue and it's a much more of an issue in Ireland than it is in um, both Australia and New Zealand. But clearly, as we have things like high stakes testing around literacy and numeracy, we have increasing levels of anxiety in the population. And um, that's playing out, I think, in terms of offensive behaviour at school. So there's a lot of parental, parental um, issues around this and schools are really struggling with how to deal with people who are behaving so badly. Um, I don't know what the situation would be like in Canada, but um, probably anecdotally you would hear similar sorts of stories, I imagine. And if we look at all of that taken together as a composite psychosocial risk indicator, um, you can see that there's a, a quite a different picture between principals and the general population. So the last column in each of these, which is the, the yellowy um, 
column is is the general population figures, and you can see that no risk people uh, in schools is very low. The low risk is about the same as the population, but the moderate risk is way way above. Highs about the same, very highs a bit lower. So principals are bunched up in the middle. Now, what does a moderate risk mean? Moderate risk means seven times um, more likelihood of um, stress problems, nearly nine times more um, risk of burnout, and six times the risk of, oh, sorry, four times the risk of poor health and four times the risk of sleeping problems, what we're seeing. Now, the interesting thing about this is the moderate risk is between three and six items, which I won't go into the details of it, but principles, all of these um, details of this are uh, the domains that I've just been showing you are all scored between one and 100. And on uh, uh, one of those where you expect a score to be low, anybody who's scored 75 or above gets a tick. And that um, adds up to their, their risk profile. And if it's a score that you would like to be high and they score below 25, they get a tick. And we just literally count up the ticks at the end of that thing and, and then give people a risk profile. So the moderate risk is between three and six. And we've got a number of principals who are reporting moderate risk, but they have five or six ticks. So they're only one thing away from going to high risk. And you can see that the increase from moderate to high is just a huge jump. So we've got some really um, troubling results here. And, and I'm being far more um, prescriptive in my feedback to the principals. So in the, in the survey, each principal, as they hit send on their last question, um, gets taken to an interactive web page with their own individual results. And it's the sort of map that I've just been showing you, but there's a dot in there, which is your individual score on each of those things. And people, and people can track themselves over time. Um, what's happened with that is uh, we also give what we call a red flag email to people who are showing all kinds of um, problems, like the sleeping problems and things. And we're tracking now at about 20% of principals are getting red flag emails through every year, which is um, a real concern. And these are the things that are causing it. So sleeping problems, as you can see, it's more than 50%. Low general health, high burnout, high stress, and then it declines a little bit. So there's lower percentages of the other things, but sleeping problems are the biggest indicator. And I guess I would encourage you to be talking to your principals about if they're not sleeping well to do something about it. And firstly, that means going to your doctor and checking if there's not a physical issue around that because as people age, things like sleep apnea can become an issue and no amount of um, relaxation or lowering stress is going to solve sleep apnea. You need the machine. But if it's not that, then you need to um, change the way you are operating so that you can start to sleep more peacefully. As they say, you know, sleep peacefully to avoid resting in peace. Um, the other thing that we measure is um, social capital. And social capital is um, a mixture of those things I showed you around trust. So low um, or high, vertical trust, horizontal trust and justice. When you put those together... Um, you get a measure of a global measure of social capital. And when the social capital is high, the composite psychosocial risk goes down by 12%, which is a huge impact. And the social capital in schools is high. It's tr it has been tracking down over the life of the survey, which is not a good thing, but it started from a very high base. And it's clearly related to the um, quality of leadership. So leaders set the conditions in which social capital can emerge in schools. And clearly it has a profound effect on their own health, but I'm sure it has a profound effect on the health of everybody in the school as well. Um, so I guess um, what people need to look at in this is um, 
clusters of factors. If, you, if you're trying to look at what's going on and how to build social capital, these are the sorts of key issues. And Fiona, I'm sure you're happy to give the slides to people so they can be distributed. Um, yeah, Kevin's already downloaded them to the computer. Oh, right. okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, you know, I won't stay on these things too long, but, but schools tend to fall into one of these patterns. <laughs> And they they are different for different types of schools and different contexts and things. Um, these are the sorts of things I guess that, that's really important not to kind of latch onto details, but to think of of clustering around um, patterns of behaviour and working at, at a, a systemic level to uh, to address these things. Um, now, just quickly. After seven years, we've had some pretty big impacts in terms of policy um, in Australia. So you can see the good news, it's become Green Party, it became Green Party policy to support principals in 2013. They got onto it very quickly. But then by 2014, the Labor um, Party, which is the sort of same as Labor parties in, in other countries, um, got onto it and they released a, a big wellbeing strategy in um, 2017 and they've increased their um, attention to this in 2018. They've, they've got me now as a, um, a key strategist around their, some of their work practices. New South Wales, same thing. They've put in $100 million now into supporting new principals in the last 12 months. So that's pretty impressive. Um, they've realised how important these um, people are to the health of the education system and they're now starting to, to look at it. South Australia's done the same thing. Western Australia um, and Tasmanian parliaments have discussed this. Western Australia put a lot of money in a couple of years ago. I think they, they are a bit like um, Alberta. There's a lot of mining money and that kind of fluctuates around... Um, year by year and so that the money's not quite so good in Western Australia at the moment as it was a few years ago so I think that money's diminishing but Fiona might know more about that because that's where she's from. Um, Tasmania have done similar sorts of things but they don't have a lot of money but there's certainly there's a big push now it's because the survey's been done as an independent project and the the results get released in the media every year we get very high media coverage um, Basically, governments can't ignore it anymore, which is what they were doing beforehand. So there are a number of recommendations in, in the reports which you can download, and probably the Australian one, the most recent Australian one's the, the one to look at first because there's a number of pages of, of recommendations, and I, I imagine a lot of that could be very useful to you as well. But really, we're taking an approach of well-being is, is everybody's responsibility. So individual principals have to take their own um, responsibility for their part in the process. But governments need to um, look at things differently. Employers need to look at things differently. Professional associations like yours, I think, have a huge role here because there has to be speaking with one voice. And the voice has been very um, disparate in Australia for all kinds of reasons. I don't know whether you're a bit more organised, but from what I hear, you are. <laughs> so you're probably doing much better. Um, but individual leaders really need to um, take control of their own work-life balance. And at that... Uh, Phil, Kevin, uh, thank you again for <laughs> being with us today. Um, just to set the context in BC, so uh, BC principals and vice principals are not part of the teachers' union. There's only three provinces in the entire country where they're outside of the union. In all other parts of Canada, principals and vice principals are part of the teachers' union. So um, from my experience, when you talk with a principal who's inside the union as it goes to outside the union, the context of leadership is quite different. So um, one example is... Um, I would say for BC's principals and vice principals, you know, that while the summertime is a good break, I, I would say it's sort of um, detoxing. That's what it's become now rather than a holiday. Um, it's not unusual for principals and vice principals to work three or four or five weeks of that summer holiday, whereas if you are a principal inside the union, 
you're basically guaranteed, uh, you know, the eight weeks or nine weeks that teachers are going to get. So I'm just curious, and I know you've only looked at a few jurisdictions, but um, from your understanding of the research, is there a difference between sort of the workload capacity stress levels for our principals who might be in the union as opposed to those who are outside the union? Uh, in Australia, the principals can be in the union, and, and many are, but there's um, been a, a kind of, I think, a very silly kind of demarcation within the union, which um, tends to take teachers' sides in a dispute. And so the principals have generally, eh, I think, over probably the last 15 years, have been moving away from the union and there is now actually a principal's, the equivalent of a principal's union right. um, that a lot of principals now belong to. Um, it's, it's not in every state yet, but they are the only other organisation who are allowed to um, collectively bargain for principal's working conditions. Um, so there's been, yeah, there's been a real issue around that and I think... Um, in New Zealand, they've done it much better. The, the, the union looks after both principals and teachers and probably because they're a smaller country, they've got less members, they have to find a way of doing it and they can support both sides in a dispute um, happily with, you know, I don't know how they do it in terms of structure, but everybody seems to be happy to be in the union, whether you're a teacher or a principal in New Zealand. And things work much better there because of that, I think. Whereas Australia, it doesn't work very well at all. Um, Ireland have a, a, a whole lot of unique problems. I mean, their, their major problems are really around the issue of church versus state because there's so many, about 95% of um, schools are Catholic schools where the church owns the facility, pays the salary, all of that kind of thing. That's why there's so many one-teacher schools because each parish owns their own school and the, right. the priests... The, his, the history of this is that priests would put a little primary school, one teacher school, on the on the border of the parish to try and snaffle a few kids from the neighbouring parish. So you might have two one teacher schools that are fifty metres away from each other, but they're not going to merge, combine resources, do any of those things because they're um, governed completely differently. So yeah, there's no. Um, because people have always asked me this, you know, where, where is best practice? Well, I don't see best practice anywhere. And, in fact, the Finnish Principals Organisation have asked me to um, do the survey because they say their principles are going under at a rate of knots. Right. They're yeah. supposed to be the world leaders in all of this. So <laughs> we need a kind of root and branch um, reorganisation of the work, I think and a bit of a change in the expectations of what schools can do, not just yeah. principal. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got a question. I don't know if you've done any research on this, Phil, or you've come across it, but one of the systemic issues or changes that's occurred in BC here is the advent of private HR professionals coming into the educational sector. And enforcing more private sector HR practices and kind of an enhanced investigative relationship with the administrators. And so there's this perceived and real threat of the vulnerability of being investigated. And there's no quantitative data that I'm aware of right now that illustrates the increase of that, but it's a variable that we're seeing more and more affecting people's sense of well-being and vulnerability at work. Have you got anything like that from your side? Absolutely. In Australia, that's a really big issue. Um, we have, you know, the whole thinking around this is deficit model thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, we, yeah, have this audit culture that is rampant mm -hmm. and um, this sort of blaming teachers and principals for whatever goes wrong, at the same time expecting schools to fix every social problem that there is. So it doesn't matter what it is, somebody will come out and say, we have a problem with drugs, schools need to have a drug program. Mm -hmm. We have a problem with violence, schools need to do this. We have a problem with drowning, schools need to run swimming programs. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what it is, any social problem, schools are supposed to solve it. Mm -hmm. And 
So, the, yeah, the job is impossible in that sense. And yeah, just, just to build on a bit more. And the other yeah. thing that's happening is there is now this big push for private providers mm -hmm. to um, provide education. So companies okay. like... See if there's any other questions. Well, and into the first world through um, measurement practices and saying we can run your schools more efficiently, we can provide all the Absolutely. curriculum, and we can do everything. It's really easy. They, they keep selling the, you know, it's easy for us to do it. And I think the risk is that we're, the, the whole risk is, is that we are in danger of politicians deciding to outsource education to private providers. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's a, a, a really big risk in the, the coming while because most politicians seem to cost education as a cost rather than see it as an investment in the, the nation's future. And so if you think of it as a cost, you try and keep costs down. If you think of it as an investment, you start to look for return on investment. And if you're looking for a return on investment in lots of things that we do in education, you would say, let's stop and do it a different way. But because they see it as a cost, they go, that's good, costs are down, let's keep going. And so it's up to um, professional associations to change that narrative. And, um, and one of the things that I know that the Association of School and College Leaders did in the UK was they developed what they called a blueprint um, because they wanted to change the narrative and they were having, um, uh, they, were, they were finding that all that they were doing was being reactive to things mm -hmm. and so what they wanted to do was be proactive and so they developed a blueprint um, in some key areas that they wanted to see some, um, some change happen and they went to government with the blueprint and what they actually found was over a period of time that um, uh, governments started to incorporate some of those ideas in their manifestos um, when there was, you know, especially if you go just before, at the right time before they're developing their plans for um, election strategies and, and so that's what they did and they actually got quite a lot of leverage on some of the things that they wanted to um, open conversations about and they were able to affect some change as a result of that. Now, I know that... Um, that they're developing their next blueprint at the moment and they're going to bring that blueprint to council meeting in Ireland in uh, um, um, August because what they want to get is some global feedback around what it is that they're putting in their blueprint. Plus they want to, they want to share that with other associations so that people can see what how effective they were in, um, in what they did with their first um, blueprint and what they're going to be putting into their second one so um it's a it's a way of um going on the front foot rather than always being on the back foot mm. yeah. yeah uh so phil i have another question for you but i'm just going to invite um any of our attendees online if you want to type in a question um then we'll give phil an opportunity to respond to that but uh just the context piece first phil so we're we have 20, almost 2,500 members of the Principal Vice Principal Association around the province. They, uh, there was a landmark Supreme Court case ruling just over a year ago that um, required another 3,700 teachers in the system, another increase of about 10% provincially, um, which put tremendous stress on principals and vice principals to fill those positions. Um, yet substitute teachers, TTOC lists back up to historic levels. And so what we do know most recently is, um, and, and they, I think it's safe to say there's a direct correlation, um, the number of principals and vice principals on long-term disability has doubled since the implementation of this agreement and the ruling this case. Mm -hmm. And our data says that really clearly. We put five surveys out to our members about how are you dealing with this situation. So, um, you likely didn't pick up on it, but the collective jaw drop in the room when you show us a slide that says a hundred million dollars is put towards principal well-being. Yeah. That's just that that doesn't exist in our sector really. Even even when we present our survey data to government, um, 
it's hard to even get a response to the email, <laughs> like "thank you for your submission." Mm-hmm. Right, that's where we are. Um, so I'm that's where to... I started. Okay. So when I in year one, I had pretty much very similar data to what I've been yeah. showing. One one state minister of education didn't. I mean, I sent reports to every minister and every shadow minister around the country. One of those ministers in my home state of Victoria didn't respond to me but responded through the media and said, I haven't seen the data but it can't be right. <laughs> Quote, unquote. Right. Right. So there was just absolute denial of anything that was going on. Now, that's been the same. The two largest states, Victoria and New South Wales, have held out the longest and it's only in year seven that they've suddenly kind of come round and said, actually, there is a problem, can you help us? Now, and that's taken seven years of data and getting very big media impact every year because of the, particularly the offensive behaviour stuff, the, the newspapers love reporting that. Um, but because it was independent, it wasn't, you know, me pushing a barrow, I'm not the union, I'm not the professional association, I'm just a researcher. Right. And um, they, in the end, can't avoid it. And my sort of sneaky um, agenda with all of this was, you know, the baby boomers still set the political agenda in Australia. They probably do in Canada as well. But their grandkids are through university now. They're not interested in education like they used to be. They're interested in healthcare and aged care because that's the, their big thing. And I was hoping that health ministers would lean on education ministers right. who are now sort of last picked in cabinet um, to say, you are costing the health system too much. <laughs> so um, that potentially is having some effect now. But it takes a long time. It's a slow burn to get them to, to listen. But I Um, started where you seem to be now, which is them just denying that there's an issue because it's so big, so ingrained, um, and everybody knows that teachers and principals don't work very hard and they have long holidays and they finish work at 3 o'clock and all that sort of rubbish. And everybody knows how to run a school because they've been in one. You know, they're the things you're fighting all the time. So, Phil, in in respect to um, Victoria, um, just to give a bit of context, they put $4 million into their um, strategy that they are developing, that you're um, working with them on, and $5 million. And the the two $50 million lots that went into New South Wales, um, one was was, um, to counter workload and so yep. it went into staffing just so that people are aware yeah, yeah. so it went into staffing because um uh, they really realized that they it, through the autonomy agenda that they had put so much work on leaders in schools that they were crippled crippling them and so the 50 million was to um give them some uh give them something back in terms of staffing to be able to deal with that yeah. so that's and it one was particularly half. business managers and that's right um, administrative support yeah and then the yeah. the other 50 million do you want to just explain how that was or how that's earmarked and it's over four yeah. years isn't it four yes years? I think so. yeah yeah And that's for induction and support of new principles because we have this um, rapid changeover that's happening and um, they've, in their wisdom, decided that you can't just drop people into the role and have them survive or hope they'll survive. You actually can provide a whole lot of systemic supports for them. So there's a lot of networking opportunities, professional learning, all kinds of things for um, new principles. We'll see how it works. The devil is going to be in the detail in these things, but they're in fairly close communication with, I think, the union and the um, professional associations on how to best 
use that money and it'll be a work in progress but it's a very good start of course yeah and so i was speaking with um kevin and um one of the superintendents today about networks and how new south wales and uh, western australia and and victoria um all have a, ne a quite a sophisticated network network um, of schools working together and so um, that's how they push out some of these things is through networks so um, yeah so and that's just, based on Canadian research that's you know Michael Fawn and Andy Hargrove's work that's right that. yeah and and the the Kiwis especially are, are really um, uh, doing a whole lot of stuff in networks as a yeah. result of um, Hargrove's and Fulham's work um, so just wondering if there's any other questions. Just realising that it's almost five o'clock. So. Yeah, Phil, yeah. sorry. Uh, thank you. This has been fantastic. I really, again, appreciate uh, your time today. It's very um, eye-opening. I'm curious about um, one of the challenges that we have in our jurisdiction is recruitment and retention. And mm -hmm. you know, compensation and benefits is a factor. Fiona was in one of our presentations yesterday, so I think she understands the VC context around that. But from my personal perspective, I do think it's more about work intensification than it is about total compensation. So does your data touch on that as well? Are, are For work intensification issues and well-being issues, are teacher leaders less likely or uh, less inclined to move into school leadership positions? Yeah. We've, we've got, I mean, it's very hard to get the figures accurately on this, but a few people have been trying to get it. And, and the, um, it looks like there's something like an 80% decline, 80% decline in real application rates for the principalship at a time when about 80% of principals are within four or five years of retirement. Wow. So we've got a looming crisis. And I think there's, it's kind of the sting in the tail of distributed leadership. As um, the aspirants get closer to the top job and they see the cost in terms of health and well-being of the principal, they go, "Why would I do that job for another few thousand dollars a year when I can sit at a lower level and be relatively okay?" Um, yeah, so we, we're having a huge problem now in Portugal. They've got that same problem and they responded by saying, if you're a principal now, you have five schools because they can't get people to, to yeah. fill the position. So you're yeah. now a super principal. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, but they didn't um, give them any more money. They just said no. you've got five schools. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. partly, they, you know, they have economic problems as well yeah. as, as yeah. Uh, leadership problems and they've sort of solved yeah. both with the stroke of a pen. That's why... The narrative around this needs to be really carefully constructed because otherwise, you know, there's a sense of making it look like the the solutions are impossible and, and you know, Pearson will walk in and take over. Mm -hmm. And in some of the third world countries where it's just very attractive for them to have them do that, they only have 30% of the teachers with actual qualifications. So it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is absolutely what's happening here as well, too. As a matter of fact, I had two chats with principals today who um, they're, uh, they're going to have to be either responsible for two schools or going from two to three schools for next year. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a silly situation. I mean, you're just, you're not setting these people up to be successful. It's going to create some significant health concerns for those people yeah. and a significant cost in the long run. And, and there is research what? being done in um, uh, Canadian research that's been done. So Katina Pollock has been doing um, yeah. uh, research on uh, um, workload and um, Karen Edge from UCL has been doing um, on retention and participation and Gen Y. And so there's a, there's a WISE paper that has been uh, through WISE, um, funded through mm. WISE, um, that um, that you can have a look at in relation to uh, uh, retention and participation. Yeah, Phil uh, Brian Leonard. I'm a principal in the Coquitlam School District and also on the board of directors. My question is: What we hear in Canada, but particularly in British Columbia, is the fact of our we've got this um, 
a wonderfully successful school system, which we do. Uh, very much we are high achieving uh, results with our kids. But what my question is, that's the narrative that we hear in the system. And we know that there are our schools, kids are doing well. But as a result of the investment based on the survey results in Australia, did it have any bearing? Was there any noticeable results from student achievement results as a result of better leadership in the schools? I mean, in all this data in other jurisdictions, but particularly with your work there? Well, it's only just been implemented, so it's too early to tell that. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, you have to go in a minute. I know. Yeah. yeah. The um, the thing that's really going to show up in this is going to be student results, but that's going to be very difficult to attribute to that fifty million dollars for principals for new principals and the fifty million dollars of administrative support. There are too many intervening variables. And the danger will be that politicians will say, didn't see any effect, and they'll pull the money. Yes. So I don't know. But it's certainly way too early to tell now because it's only just been implemented. Right. So and we know you've got to go, but can I just, um, uh, before you go, um, and I'll do the, the global challenge stuff, but can you just... Okay. Um, talk just ever so briefly about how we came to that. The global challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how well, we came to that together. Yeah, they they contacted me and said, you know, they had this data. They wanted to share data with us. Uh, they wanted to combine. They're clearly committed to helping people look after their own health and well-being, and they've they're clearly committed in terms of organisational responses. And um, it started in Australia and then was the company was bought out, I think, by Richard Branson, which is why it's now called the Global Challenge or the Virgin Pulse Global Challenge. But it was an Australian um, uh, idea. And we, we began these conversations around how to combine this thing. In the end, it's become... Um, I think a great idea because they've they've given the uh, ICP a, a special price to to do that, and they they're really helping principals to do something about team building. So it's going to build social capital in the schools, I think, as well as build people's health at the same time. And so it starts to address one of those concerns about people taking responsibility for their own health and well-being. Yeah, and 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 it was the connection through you and the survey that actually brought us to um, Virgin, and so we're really grateful to that. And I'm going to talk about that, and I know that you've got to go. So, um, okay. um, thanks. Right. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank yeah. you so much, Phil. Okay. It's been fantastic. Okay. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll see you later. Okay.